So hello and welcome. Thank you, Professor, for asking me to talk about uh, ultrasound in medical patients. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Bees from King's College London. I've practiced radiology for 20 years. Uh, and my training is slightly hybrid. At first, I started as a physician. I got a member of the Royal College of Physi Physicians and then the Royal College of Radiology. So I started my career as a physician and then I went and moved into radiology. And I'm very aware of the demands on the physician and how radiology and ultrasound can help in medical patients. So let's see <clears throat> what the background is. Well, we could use ultrasound. Um, we can use ultrasound as an extension of the cardiovascular examination. Uh, we can look at the nails for clubbing and um, splinter hemorrhages, check the pulse if it's sinus rhythm or not, the blood pressure, look for anemia, and then uh, measure the JVP either with ultrasound or uh, visualizing it. And then we can examine the heart with uh, the stethoscope and then follow it up with ultrasound, looking for the left ventricular function. Um, pericardial effusions and right heart strain. Equally, we could use um, ultrasound as an extension of the chest examination. Uh, I've already talked about this in a previous talk, and we could use it also as an extension of the neurological examination, particularly in the neurovascular examination. Uh, when we're thinking about stroke, um, we can examine the carotid and the vertebral arteries. Uh, also, it's most useful in the extension of the abdominal examination in patients who are either jaundice or have got renal dysfunction or just abdominal pain. Uh, ultrasound is excellent at examining the viscera and can examine the bowel. And in patients with sepsis, if you're looking for the source of sepsis, ultrasound can look into the abdomen and pelvis or any areas where you suspect there is pain uh, in muscles, joints and uh, soft tissue. And ultrasound is also extremely useful in patients with lower limb swelling or upper limb swelling in which you suspect the diagnosis of thrombus. So ultrasound, showing us the anatomy and the pathology, can be an adjunct and certainly enhance the clinical examination, often leading to diagnosis, changing differentials into diagnosis. Not in all cases, particularly in uh, medical cases, uh, a lot of the uh, pathologies above the diaphragm, um, but it, it can be of use, and I certainly use it uh, in medical patients examining for all of the above. So let's have a look. Uh, the cardiovascular exam. Uh, let's just see how we got here, the evolution of technology. Uh, ultrasound was invented approximately 50 years ago. Uh, 50 to 70 years ago, and there were huge machines that uh, uh, took up the whole space of a room, the size of church organs, have slowly come down in size and price. And this is a standard machine we use in our department, which is at high end, 120,000. Then in 2000, roughly, Sonosite brought out a smaller version that could be handheld and take the bedside. And that slowly evolved into the iPhone or iPad ultrasound, which is handheld and can be taken, well, absolutely anywhere. And this is the uh, butterfly, the latest iPhone-based um, imaging with ultrasound, which I have one here, um, and um, attaches to my iPhone. And in fact, I will talk about a case I went up to ITU yesterday to see, and using the iPhone made a diagnosis. So uh, ultrasound of the cardiovascular exam, I've mentioned the three things I think it could be useful for very quickly, which is, uh, is there a pericardial effusion from a subcostal view? You get the four chamber view, is there fluid around the heart? Um, then uh, an apical view, four chamber view, looking at the LV function. So end diastole minus end systole over end diastole produces a percentage and that's called a Simpson. You can also measure the level of the mitral valve. The anterior leaflet of the mitral valve should touch the septum. And if it's greater than seven millimeters away from the septum, it means the left heart is dilated and would indicate poor LV function. 
And in the right patient, patients who are breathless with chest pain, uh, you can examine the parasternal position. This is a, a, an axial view. And here's the left ventricle. And look how the right ventricle is, is like a half moon. It's a low pressure system, very thin walled, uh, five to 10 millimeters of mercury. When the pressure increases, it becomes a full moon. So it uh, becomes more rounded. Uh, and that's what you see in patients such as this who have the full moon uh, in patients who have outflow obstruction or pulmonary embolus. So there's the half moon. Here's the full moon. That's RV dilatation. In fact, it's compromising the septum and compromising the left ventricle. Uh, this is right outflow obstruction. And that can be uh, an adjunct to your clinical examination. And the more advanced you get, you can start looking at valvular dysfunction, particularly if you have heard things with the stethoscope, systolic murmurs, mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, diastolic murmurs, such as mitral, um, mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation. So uh, let's have a look at this examination of the chest. Uh, you can have a chest x-ray, particularly if you look here, we've got indistinct hemidiaphragms, also silhouette signs, there's a veil-like density. Ultrasound will tell you what is occurring at those bases. It can be normal lung, which is uh, highly reflective. Um, this is at the right lower lobe, but the lung is aerated. There's no image behind because sound reflects, is reflected by air in the normal lung. The lung can become solid, which is in consolidation or pneumonia. Um, this is on the left, and you have these branching structures, which are bright, which are the air bronchograms. Remember, we're just looking at the same pathology uh, and anatomy on a different um, platform. Or well, there can be no image whatsoever because it's got pleural fluid on the hemidiaphragm and there's through transmission of sound waves. So ultrasound can be very helpful uh, where clinical examination uh, is either difficult, i.e. in supine patients, or just um, can be difficult because of interpretation. And in the breathless patient, uh, either acute or chronic, then ultrasound can also be helpful looking for consolidation or, or collections in the pleural space. Um, again, it can be looking at collections. And again, this is a, um, a, a collection in the pleural space. It's an exudate with fibrinous um, stranding, uh, or in the case of this chest x-ray, loss of the silhouette sign, hemidiaphragm, and uh, here is a pleural effusion. Um, here we've got pneumonia where it's solid and gray, and then we've got a paraneumonic effusion with pneumonia in this case. Uh, this is available on my website, which is um, called ultrasoundresearch.co.uk. Uh, I've got lots of uh, infographics on how to use ultrasound in certain clinical scenarios. I've been lucky enough to be presenting for 20 years at the British Medical Ultrasound Society. They've all been peer reviewed. I have actually won some prizes, um, which I won't talk about, but they're, they're all available. I think an infographic just gives you an overview of what you're, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, it gives you a perspective. I really enjoy perspectives, either with history, geography, or just an overview visually. Uh, ultrasound of a swollen leg. Um, or deep vein thrombosis imaging. Um, I've talked about this before in the ITU case. You've got to know the anatomy, um, common, the external iliac vein, the common femoral vein, which you see at the inguinal region, uh, then goes to the superficial femoral vein down to the popliteal, then there's a trifurcation. And we can examine the entirety of this vessel looking for thrombus. Um, if the vessel, which is a low pressure system, five to 10 millimeters of mercury, the blood is returning to the heart. If there is thrombus in this vessel, it will not collapse on pressure. If you press on this vessel, it should collapse as, as we have here. So here's the common femoral vein. When you put pressure on it, collapses. If it contains thrombus, it will not collapse. So this is, a, this is thrombus, uh, epigenic material in the vein. And I often do it across the vessel so that you can't slip off it. Uh, and I examine the whole of the uh, deep femoral system of the leg, which is the common femoral vein, superficial femoral vein, and then popliteal, and go down to the trifurcation. 
And of course, in the failures, ultrasound is extremely useful because what it will do is demonstrate the anatomy and will differentiate between renal failure, between uh, renal causes and post-renal causes. Uh, so pre-renal causes and renal causes are medical, as we all know, and post-renal causes are surgical. So it will select out patients using ultrasound which are obstructive and hydronephrotic. And if you've got bilateral hydronephrosis and you've got renal failure, then you've got to assume it's due to obstruction and the, the pathology is either in the retroperitoneum or at the bladder level. And these patients uh, can do well with nephrostomy or intervention. Equally, if you do an ultrasound and the kidneys are small and shrunken and bright, well then that's chronic renal failure. So it could be acute on chronic, or if they're just swollen and bright, then um, it could be due to acute tubular necrosis. So ultrasound can be helpful in the renal failure patient. Equally, in the liver failure patient or the jaundice patient, uh, ultrasound can be useful, again, to differentiate between pre-hepatic, hepatic and post-hepatic. Post-hepatic are due to ducts being obstructed, either from stones or pancreatic tumor or bile duct tumor. Um, and that's a surgical cause and they will go and see the surgeons. Whereas if the ducts are not dilated, and here we have dilated ducts, which are branching structures within the liver, almost too many tubes, the portal vein is posterior, these are the ducts and they're dilated. We've got to assume there's an obstruction in the common duct or at the gallbladder level or at the pancreatic level, it could be stones, it could be tumor, then these uh, would be decompressed either across the liver as a PTC or from below an ERCP um, and relieve the jaundice. It's a surgical cause. And if it's stones, it tends to be benign. And if it's tumor, it tends to be malignant. Um, but if you do an ultrasound, the liver is shrunken, small, irregular outline, ascites, large spleen, then that's a medical cause. That's a hepatic cause of the jaundice. So, um, Let's just talk about acute, um, acute neurology. So this patient's got acute ataxia and a Horner's syndrome, very small pupil, partial ptosis, um, and there's several levels that it could be at, but certainly one of those at the brainstem level. Um, and you can do an ultrasound and look at the vertebral vascularity, the vertebral artery, there's a thrombosed uh, vertebral artery here. And this would be in keeping with a brainstem stroke such as lateral medullary syndrome, posterior inferior cerebellar artery thrombosis produces this. This is on diffusion weighted imaging. This is restricted diffusion in keeping with an acute stroke. And they have a host of neurological symptoms and signs. Equally acute corners, it could be a dissection of the carotid. The sympathetic supplies in the carotid sheath, if it's stretched, you can get a hornus. So uh, let's talk about some cases that I've seen. So an eight-year-old boy, failure to thrive, abnormal liver function tests with chest symptoms. Uh, I first saw him with ultrasound before he saw the physicians and he had this abnormal liver texture, these swirling changes. And these are changes that you'd get in cystic fibrosis. Um, and this is liver cystic fibrosis. It's a coarse um, cirrhosis. Uh, chest pain and collapse. Well, a 50-year-old man in recess with chest pain and collapse. Um, here we have, uh, we did an echo. It's a right, it's a parasternal short axis. Here's the left ventricle, here's the right ventricle. It's not a half moon, it's a full moon and it's compressed in the left ventricle, there's outflow obstruction. The CTPA demonstrates a saddle embolus going across both pulmonary arteries. This is uh, outflow obstruction due to uh, pulmonary embolus. Um, these patients can be um, anticoagulated or actually thrombolyzed and relieve the obstruction. Cough in a 50-year-old man with a temperature who's septic. There is this abnormal area here on the chest x-ray. There's loss of the silhouette sign of the left heart and the left hemidiaphragm. There is this line here. It looks like it's a pleural collection. And ultrasound confirms that there is fluid in the pleura with these um, 
fibrinous strands here. This is an exudate. The most likely cause is due to infection, and this is actually an empyema. Um, and I've seen several of these. Uh, introduce a needle, aspirate person, and introduce a drain under ultrasound guidance. Here's a 70 year old man who's breathless. Here's his chest x ray. He's got a globular heart. It's actually huge. Um, he's got a small uh, complex ECG uh, and then a subcostal view with the ultrasound. He's got a very large pericardial effusion presented with breathlessness. Now, this is an effusion, it's around the heart. In fact, look, it's embarrassing the right heart. This is at low pressure, is the right heart, five to 10 millimeters of mercury. This is why you get cardiac tamponade, you get poor venous return, and you get pulsus paradoxus, and this is embarrassing of the right heart. The left heart's a little bit more sturdy because it's a higher pressure and a thicker muscular wall. So just from knowing the anatomy and the pathology, you can work out how the patient presents. Pericardial effusion, which is either transudate or exudate. If it's a transudate, it's generally due to the failures or inflammation, heart, uh, heart failure, renal failure, liver failure. If it's an exudate, high protein content, and we know that by aspirating it, we think about infection, types of infection of bacterial, mycobacterial, viral, and fungal. Mycobacterial definitely can cause a pericardial effusion. Uh, uh, and the other category we think about is tumor, either benign, malignant, primary, or secondary. Um, and we can use ultrasound to aspirate the fluid for diagnostics and also to insert it in the brain. So here's a patient, a 30-year-old man with weight loss who's very ill. And uh, the chest X-ray is presented to the medics. He's got multiple soft tissue opacities throughout both lung fields, throughout both zones. Um, we think this uh, could be tumor. It could be benign or malignant. Uh, the benign process we think about is sarcoid. I recently had a doctor in my office. I've given a lecture about a month ago saying that you know even if we see soft tissue masses in the chest x-ray we've got to think about a benign process and the young doctor came in he's quite distressed uh, with a chest x-ray not dissimilar to this and he said to the patient's relatives that i'm afraid your 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 relative is severely ill with the abnormal change in the chest x-ray and the relative said oh he's had sarcoid for 15 years um, and the doctor had to backtrack but anyway this isn't sarcoid these are multiple soft tissue masses we think it's tumor, benign or malignant. We think it's malignant. There are multiple soft tissue in all zones. Is it primary or secondary? Well, these are most likely secondaries. In a young man, we'd be thinking about doing an ultrasound of his testes. And here we have an echo pore area. And this is a um, primary testicular tumor. A mass within, intraaxially within the testes is tumor until proven otherwise. So this is how ultrasound can be helpful. You have a chest X-ray here in a young person. It's an unusual tumor. It could be lymphoma, melanoma, uh, and testicular. And ultrasound can help you. These may not be palpable, but you can see them with ultrasound. Let's have a look at this patient here. Jaundice man, 50 years old with weight loss. Here's his abdomen. We've done an ultrasound, and um, he has multiple echo poor areas in his liver, his liver is expanded, and these are probably most likely due to tumor. He hasn't got a temperature. It's either benign or malignant. It looks malignant. It's primary, most likely secondaries, and um, he's got eye problems. Didn't ultrasound the eye, and here he has a mass of the posterior aspect. This is a choroidal melanoma with liver secondaries. Again, the diagnosis has been enhanced by using ultrasound, which you can use at the bedside, particularly with these new units, which are, as I've shown you, uh, extremely uh, portable and of high quality. So this is a really important case, I think, the vomiting patient. It can be very difficult when the patient's vomiting uh, to know exactly what's going on. It can, obviously can be gastroenteritis or some sort of infection, but what you don't want to miss is small bowel obstruction. Um, and ultrasound can be very helpful. So we do an ultrasound of the upper abdomen and we see these dilated loops of small bowel. Now these are valvular conventi going across the lumen. So this is small bowel, it's peristalsis. This is small bowel obstruction. You don't want to miss this um, 
because this is a surgical case and the ultrasound can be very helpful um, in seeing whether it's gastroenteritis or some sort of upper um, GI um, infection or selecting out patients who have small bowel obstruction because uh, the longer you sit on small bowel obstruction, the worse the prognosis. So it's important. And it's all it is a simple ultrasound of the abdomen. It will tell you exactly what's going on just by looking at the caliber of the bowel. And these are really important because what you want to do is put an NG tube down and drain the stomach. You don't want them aspirating. Uh, we've had a case where that happened. Uh, small bowel obstruction, upper GI small bowel obstruction was missed and the patient aspirated. And uh, that, the general outcome is, is a lot worse. This is uh, the case I went up to ITU last night for a patient with an acute limb that was um, clearly um, of a different color. It's swollen, the entire limb, it's, um, it's purple. Um, and I used my iPhone ultrasound, I went up and um, this is um, what I saw was that there was a thrombus in the common femoral vein. This was not compressible with ultrasound. Um, very easy to make the diagnosis compared to the other slide. So what you have here is you've got outflow obstruction it's producing an ischemic limb here. This is called um, Caroli Dolans. Um, and some patients do well by actually uh, introducing a catheter using thrombolysis with a, a filter. Uh, IVC filter to try and clear this because uh, they, they can have a poor prognosis with a post phlebitic limb. So, um, yes, this is uh, what I saw last night with my iPhone ultrasound. So, collapse of unknown cause. Uh, patient's got abdominal pain and back pain. Ultrasound of the abdomen it demonstrates this structure in the midline. Here's the spine. This is uh, an aortic aneurysm, it's, it's ruptured. And again, ultrasound can help you to um, select out these patients. This, this was a medical patient who had collapsed and then it becomes a surgical case. So ultrasound is the most versatile tool. It gives diagnostic certainty, very high negative predictive values, and is extremely good at turning differentials into diagnosis. Thank you. Hello, radiology. Uh, thank you, Professor. We're going to talk about ultrasound in surgical cases. Um, here we are. Um, so uh, again, Dr. Richard Bees, King's College, was a physician, now a radiologist, but we do a lot of surgical imaging using ultrasound. And our objectives of this talk is about the acute abdomen, the acute pelvis, I'll talk briefly about acute scrotum, collections, jaundice, and use and intervention. In the UK, uh, we have right upper quadrant pain and right ileal fossa pain we investigate with ultrasound, with CT for other presentations such as bowel obstruction, left ileal fossa pain, and peritonism. However, if you're outside the UK and you have no access to any x-rays, you could use ultrasound for virtually everything. Uh, it will demonstrate the anatomy and the pathology of most pathologies in the abdomen and pelvis. So let's have a look at right upper quadrant pain. A 40-year-old woman with right upper quadrant pain. Here we have a gallbladder here, going through the right lobe of the liver, and we have an echo uh, density here, which casts a shadow, and this is a stone. This is a gallbladder that has got stone in the neck of the gallbladder. And this is another stone in the neck of the gallbladder. And the gallbladder wall is thickened. This is acute cholecystitis. Uh, and it's a cause of acute right of a quadrant pain. Now, you can have biliary colic where this intermittently obstructs the gallbladder. The gallbladder contracts on it, causes excruciating pain. Then you get stasis and you can get infection here uh, that becomes inflammation and cholecystitis. This can turn into pus and become an empyema. This is a very common finding we find in patients with right of the quadrant pain. So let's have a look at a 50 year old man with right of the quadrant pain. Uh, well, the gallbladder was normal and there was this echo pore area. He had a temperature 
uh, and um, this is a liver abscess. This is an infection. It can be bacterial, mycobacterial, viral, or fungal. And also can be used to guide a needle in, aspirate, insert a wire, and then a drain. I've done quite a few of these, and patients tend to get better. Equally, there's another patient here with another finding and lots of multiple soft tissue abnormalities, no temperature with weight loss. And these are most likely due to tumor, can be benign or malignant, but this looks malignant, primary or secondary. Well, there are multiple, most likely secondary. We'll examine the abdomen to look for a bowel mass. So let's have a look. Here's right upper quadrant pain. Here's the right upper quadrant. Here's the anatomy. We're looking for tumor. We're looking for stones in the common duct. We're looking for stones in the gallbladder. They're in the dependent part here and also impacting the neck of the gallbladder. Here we have stones in the gallbladder, and you can have stones obstructing at any level. And when we're worried about obstruction, then we measure the common bile duct. We measure the common bile ducts in all cases, should be less than six millimeters. The common bile ducts anterior to the portal vein at the level of the right hepatic artery. And here we've got a case with lots of stones in the common bile duct. So uh, in cases of jaundice, um, we'd be looking for stones, a biliary duct dilatation, trying to differentiate, as I've said before in my previous talks, between hepatic and post-hepatic causes of jaundice. So let's have a look in the right inlet fossa. Let's say a 22-year-old male with right inlet fossa pain. This is the area we're looking at. So here's the quadrants. Let's just go back to the quadrants. Right lower quadrant, here's the pain. We're going to do an ultrasound. Um, and this is what we're looking for, really, in the right inlet fossa, most likely due to appendix or appendiceal pathology. And this is what it looks like on ultrasound. It's a blind ending tube over six millimeters in diameter. And here it is uh, graphically demonstrated. And uh, here's the psoas. Um, and the other pathology we can see in the right elect fossa. Well, uh, we can see um, thickening of the colon in colitis. I saw one uh, three days ago. Uh, where the colon is, it, it, the whole of the colon, the cecum, is thickened, or we can see uh, the small bowel, where the small bowel wall is thickened. This is the inflammatory bowel disease. So where the pathology is really important. So the differential for this is infection and inflammation, uh, but if it's small bowel or terminal island, it's almost certainly due to inflammation. That's in the UK. Um, so a palpable mass in the left upper quadrant, and here we have an abnormal soft tissue mass. It looks like a kidney. It's got some bright areas. This is the lumen, and this is gas in the lumen, and a thickened bowel. This is a clonic carcinoma until proven otherwise. Um, and we do pick up quite a few of these uh, masses using ultrasound. Uh, it's said that ultrasound can be up to 90% sensitive and specific for looking for soft tissue masses in the line of the colon. You've got to know the clonic anatomy, which isn't very difficult, but um, uh, you, you can examine the colon looking for masses. This is a very important presentation. A young woman pregnant with lower abdominal pain. I've seen three of these. Um, and what you see, what you can, well, in this case, you see nothing in the uterine cavity and she's got, she's pregnancy positive early pregnancy at less than 12 weeks, and she's got fluid in the pelvis. This is an ectopic until proven otherwise, and this is blood. Sometimes you can see the uh, implanted fetus in, in parts of the, uh, in the serosa or in the tube, um, but uh, I've seen three of these, and they, they, were, they were quite hypotensive, these patients. And it's, I put it in here because it's an extremely important so a young woman with fluid in the pelvis, uh, pregnancy positive, it's an ectopic until proven otherwise. So uh, renal pathology can present with abdominal pain, uh, particularly stones. And here we've got a demonstration of the anatomy. Um, and you can have stones at any level here. Uh, this is a pelvic junction in the ureter or actually within the bladder. Or well, this one is a staghorn calculus that fills the collecting system. We had a case uh, last week, a patient with ankylosing spondylitis who had um, 
or I'll talk about the case in a minute, but here's a stone here and a hydronephrotic kidney, normal renal outline. This, this patient's got renal colic. This is an obstructed kidney by a large stone. Um, if they're septic, they may need a nephrostomy. So hematuria in a 70-year-old man. Well, we see an awful lot of this. Uh, these are soft tissue masses from the mucosa of the bladder. This is a transitional cell carcinoma until proven otherwise. Uh, sometimes you can get masses in the bladder and they're actually hematomas. What we tend to do is move the patient around and if it moves, it's a hematoma. But if it's fixed, it's most likely a soft tissue mass due to tumor. Equally, hematuria can be presentation of a renal cell carcinoma. Here's expansion of the lower pole of the kidney due to soft tissue mass. Um, these are findings we find in patients with hematuria. The vomiting child, so the vomiting child under 10 weeks, normally boys, have often got weight loss and metabolic abnormalities. Uh, they're vomiting a lot. We do an ultrasound of the upper abdomen through the left lobe of the liver, and we see a thickened pylorus, a long pyloric canal, and the walls. So this is the normal stomach wall. It's quite thin here, about three millimeters. That becomes thickened, and this is the pylorus. And this is pyloric stenosis. We do see an awful lot of this, and these patients are then sent for surgical management. Testicular pain uh, in the presence of COVID, we've got lots of late presentations. This is what a normal testicle looks like. Five days of testicular pain. This testicle is, is enlarged and grossly abnormal with breakdown of the connective tissue. This is an infarcted, missed um, testicular torsion. We're seeing an awful lot of this at the moment. I've seen four just recently. The testicles are, the testicle is often in an abnormal plane. I've seen a twisting of the uh, spermatic cord or the snail sign, snail shell sign, uh, and then um, grossly abnormal uh, enlarged testicle, uh, with, uh, which is a different echogenicity from the normal testicle and the breakdown of the uh, connective tissue due to infarction. So, yes, so we had a patient last week who's got ankylosing spondylitis, uh, right upper, right flank pain, uh, was septic. We did an ultrasound and they had hydronephrosis. Um, and these are the papilla. This is papillary necrosis. This is ankylosing spondylitis. The non steroidal anti inflammatories can cause papilla necrosis and the papilla can slough off and go down uh, and obstruct the ureter, it obstructs at the easy ureteric junction. Uh, we drained this kidney with nephrostomy and pus was aspirated and the patient had a nephrostomy inserted and actually improved with drainage. Uh, diabetics, uh, we see a lot of diabetics who've got um, abdominal pain and uh, flexion of their hip. Um, and we can do an ultrasound, and this is a psoas, and this is a collection or abscess of the psoas. Here's the anatomy of the psoas, and here it is on CT. Again, these can be drained under ultrasound guidance using inserting a needle, then a wire, and then a drain. So ultrasound, uh, here's my website, ultrasoundresearchuk.com. Uh, uh, I recommend British Medical Ultrasound Society. Oh, the abdominal anatomy in surgical cases is quite complicated, as is the pathology, and the learning curve can be quite long. So you've got to know your objectives of the ultrasound and your limitations. And if you're stuck, please ask for help. Thank you.